Hey guys, this is Mark Owings, and I'm your host for the Unbridled Life Podcast, where we have real, raw, and unreligious conversation to encourage and challenge men and women in their daily lives. Well, welcome to the Unbridled Life Podcast. I get to do this podcast today, and we're going to be talking about male versus a man. What's the difference of it? And I have two great men. They're definitely men of God, men who follow God, men who love God and are loved by God. One of my closest friends, uh, David Terry, uh, I've written several books with him, The Original Sanctuary, The All-In Life, and there's probably more that I've forgotten about. And then Greg Potts. Y'all tell us a little bit about y'all. Uh, well, I'm David. I'm married to April for 37 years. Yes, that makes me sound really old. <laughs> I have a 26-year-old getting married in three weeks. So for the first time in 37 years, we're about to have a girl in the house. Come on. Wow. Yes. Come on. I don't know what to do with it. When Environment I get her, change. I get excited. I cry. I, uh, it's it's not bubbles. It's all that stuff. You've been praying for 26 years for this girl. It's taken a while. It's taken a quarter of a century <laughs> to, get, to get some more estrogen in the house. I have my own little mix of estrogen, but we got a new whole batch coming into the house. So uh, I'm in the real estate and construction development business in Fort Worth and been friends with you for, let's make another long hang out there statement, 20 years. I oh, my pushing, gosh. Pushing Has it been that years. long? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're getting older. It's we're true. maturing. I know it maturing. feels like it to you being friends with me that long. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It feels like a gift. And then Greg, Greg, tell us about you. You bet. I'm married to Shannon, and uh, we're at 24 years. Actually, mm-hmm. this next year will be our 25th. Uh, that in itself is a miracle. <laughs> it is. <laughs> True story. Um, three children. We're empty nesters um, and just loving life and, and uh, the empty nest. we got grandbabies. That's a whole different world that we're just walking in. And uh, I run a real estate company. I focus on farm and ranch and just love what I do. But reality is it's my ministry. That's what God's called me to do. And what's unique about you is you're in the business world, but you feel called to minister to men. Men. Yeah. It's my calling. Yeah. So you don't run a Bible study. No. Nope. No. Life gives you enough uh, encounters and divine appointments, right? Absolutely. You know, sometimes we just go out and we do real estate, but other times it's pouring. You know? So share with them, we, we're going to talk about male yeah. versus man, and you will understand this once we get going, but you were talking about just meeting a man before you got here. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we just got to talking about our children, our life, and all of that. And we actually, what kicked it off was we are talking about grandkids and how much joy they are. I, I tell my children all the time, if I knew grandkids were this much fun, I'd have had them first. <laughs> <laughs> it don't work that way, does it? No, it doesn't. But uh, he, he, he began to talk about how uh, he's seen his dad change. You know, he's a, he's, as a young man growing up, he never heard, I love you from his father. Wow. Um, just kind of. You know, he said, I knew my father loved me, but he never said it. He said, but the minute my kids walk into that house, it is coming out of his mouth audibly. But that just shows you the desire for all of us to honestly audibly hear, I'm loved. Yeah, we talk about it a lot, the five kingdom currencies. And you got to give them all away. Males will not give their words away where a man of God gives his words away. Yeah. But time, talent, treasures, words, and touch. It takes all five to raise a daughter or a man in the house. And when we don't get to hear those things, we deprive our kids of the words. We're built, those five kingdom currencies are the things that we're built to run off of. And it's the thing that shape us into being what God bent us from the original design to be, right? Yeah. So I just got a few statements. We know where we're going to land on this. We're going to land on King David. Um, but before King David was King David, he was just a boy in a shepherd field. <laughs> um, but males change based on circumstances and situations where men have an absolute truth. They're stabilized by truth. I, I think about it all the time. We live in a, in a time where a lot of affairs, a lot of things going on, men traveling, gone Monday through Thursday in the business world, out there just etching out a living, but there's a lot of ditches to fall into. 100%. Yep. And we live in a society full of suggestions. Yep. It's coming at a pace that we're not capable of handling. We're just really not. It's just coming at us so fast. Yeah. For sure. So I think... One of the things that is interesting, David, I'm going to let you kick this off. Okay. David, walk us through the Bible story of what happens, how he gets called, and it may be one of the worst father wounds ever known in the Bible. Oh, yeah, for 
And you're the one that taught it to me. <laughs> Known <laughs> yet unknown. I'm he didn't wound that. me. I'm he taught it to me. Father word. Oh, what a legacy. <laughs> we'll talk about legacy in a minute, too. Uh, well, yeah, just the the opening of, of David's life is the uh, the prophet Samuel walks into Jesse's house and says, I need to see your boys. I'm here to anoint. I'm here. To, there's, a, there's an anointed one in your home. <laughs> and Jesse lines them up. I mean, from oldest to, to, to youngest and walks all the way down the, the row. And the prophet walks up and down the row. And, I mean, something's off. It's a mess. And he says, surely this isn't, this isn't all your kids. He goes, oh, you, well, you can't mean David. Mm. And, and the prophet says, bring the boy. <laughs> and he looks at the, other, at, the, at the other boys and says, y'all stand until he gets here. No, notice he didn't. He didn't ask, "Would you go get him?" Yeah, no. It was it was a <laughs> little command. correction going on. It yeah. was a command because you had the man Samuel speaking to the male Jesse, oh. mm. and 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 having to put something in order there because see Jesse had already decided in his mind what maleness what maleness looked like, not what manhood looked like. Ooh. and 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 the and the the, the the word tells us so much. We we know so much about David. We know about his actions. But the things that the Lord says about David are always about his heart. Mm, yeah. Even just the things that the Lord recalls about David are always about David's heart. But David's initial impact was were the wounds of a father by not saying anything. It's it's the story you were just telling. Right. It, it wasn't what he did say, it's what he didn't say. He wasn't in invited- He didn't even think to invite him to the party when the prophet was coming to visit the house, knowing why he was coming, he wasn't important enough or even thought of. Or even seen by Jesse enough. to bring him I mean, in. It's one of the one of the greatest father wounds of not even spending enough time with your boy to realize that that's the kid that we now know from reading the Psalms and reading and reading the Word was the kid that was sitting outside killing lions and bears and playing music and singing. I mean, this is a ten talent kid. Sure, and Dad, and Dad doesn't know it. Yeah, yeah. The Bible actually said there. There's two male moments in here. The male moment where the dad doesn't even invite, maybe David was an illegitimate son. We don't know. Maybe right. David's, he didn't have the same mom as all those. Mm. It's also in Jewish custom that the oldest son, and even the prophet says, surely it's this one. So I don't know. You you, you know, he's Patrick Mahone. I think we right. were talking about this. He looks the part. He's got the part. He can throw the football. He can mm. do everything. But God, God rebukes both of them. First one, the prophet rebukes the dad and says we're all going to stand he's not on the other side of the street he's not running down the street and right. getting him from the snow cone stand he's on the back 40 i can't imagine how long that took but let's just say it took five hours all of them are standing there mm-hmm. because you stand in the presence of royalty and that prophet knew it the prophet gets rebuked by god and god tells him this look in your maleness you thought it was these boys, <laughs> but I don't think like you think, David, you're right. I look at the heart where males will focus on their mind. A true man of God focuses on his heart because that's what God focuses on. And we see in this story an incredible analogy, how we can walk in our maleness, our assumption about something. We're sizing someone up in this process. That's well, what you and I've talked about for years. We're living in a horizontal instead of living in the vertical. Come yeah. on. We're yeah. living in what we can see. We're living in what we can touch, feel, transact with, size up, quantify, Tangible. and compare ourselves to. Mm. That is the male. To me, that's the male disease. We're in full-blown comparison mode, most of us. I don't even realize I'm in it a lot of times when sure. I'm in it. You walked into a whatever business meeting you went to today. If I'm with you today, when I walk in the room, I'm trying to figure out how I fit. I'm doing it subconsciously. Yep. I mean, because... Even for me, and I'm the oldest guy in this room at 60 years old, I'm fighting male and manliness every minute of the day. We all are. It, yeah, if you're watching this, we're not telling you how to get there. We're telling you that we're on the way with you. It's here. a journey. It's a journey. Dude. Yeah. Not a destination. Mm-mm. Yeah. What's interesting, let's rewind this story back. Why is the prophet even there to anoint a new king? <laughs> is... Mm. We look at well, what? Well, Israel, Israel, they got a little fed up with the with the prophets and the judges. Yeah, the, the prophet and the judges, and they wanted to look like the other nations. That's what males do. They want to look like the world. And, and boy, that's mm. we could 
Mm. We could do a whole hour on that. That because alone. We, because we're living in that right now. Right. Yes, in, we are. In this country. We're wanting to look like it, it's about the appearances of what's going on there or what we th- or, or what we want to project, the facade of what we want people to see. What I want people on. to see. Right. Mm. Right. Um, and so the, the people of Israel said, we want a king. We don't look like the other kings. And God told them, he said, here's what's going to happen. If you have a king. It's going to cost you your wealth. It's going to cost you taxation. It's going to cost you your son's lives. Mm. And they said, we want that anyway because we want to be like everybody else. Mm. So it would be fair to say that they were walking in maleness. Males don't count the cost. Don't go to God and ask him. Matter of fact, they want to tell God what they want, not what he wants in their life. Hey, God, I want to go here and bless this. Yeah, that's right. And we all do it. Or, or yeah. God, I'm already here. Bless this. <laughs> <laughs> right even worse or better right. but right yeah okay but they get yeah. what they want in this guy called Saul Saul happens to be head and shoulders he is David said this in our book I think or in one of the many times we've traveled and preach he was the people's choice mm-hmm. he was tall he was handsome he looked like he could throw a spirit and lead in a country and God picks this man based upon the people's choice and gives them what they want. And it doesn't take very long for us to realize that he does not want to walk in his manhood in following God. He wants to walk in the mountains. He wants to look at a situation, and based on the situation, one of the things God gives him through this prophet Samuel, Samuel gives him clear borders and boundaries and instructions of what to go do in this war. Mm -hmm. And it was kill everything. It's unclean. But when Samuel gets there, he had walked in a priest. He had blessed him. He prayed for him. Samuel wasn't there. He got nervous. The people start chattering. What are we doing? He just goes ahead and and blesses the meal, goes to war. God still God gives him the war. But guess what? He keeps the king and he keeps all of the sheep and the cows. The prophet shows up and says, Hey, you've, you've done a good job walking in your maleness, but you have not been a man today and followed the things of God. And Samuel said, Here's, it's the craziest. This is what males do. They deny it, and they won't own their own shit. And shit would mean, for me, is just stuff hidden in the trenches. Mm. It's stuff hidden. Good, Mark. Like God didn't see what he did. And he lies to the prophet, and the prophet says, What is this bleeding of sheep that I hear? Mm. Why is this king here? Well, guess what the prophet does? He kills the sheep and kills the king and says, this is what God commanded. You did what you wanted to do, and that's what males do. But if you're going to follow God, you're going to have to do what he does. Mm -hmm. And as men, we're going to have to understand, you're going to have to, if you're listening to this, I say this all the time, it's hanging up on my my wall to remind me every day, you want to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. You want to be able to receive what he said, even though it's not what you want to do. You've got to hear it. You got to receive it. You got to believe it. And the last one, you got to obey it. It's not about your feelings. A male will walk and be led by his motion. A man will walk, a man of God will walk by the truth of God. And that applies in all of our life, right? So self-reflection, it, it, you know, you talked about shit, stuff hidden in the trenches. Yeah. We were talking just a little bit earlier. You know, most of us driving down the highway at 60 miles an hour, and yep. we don't see anything in the trench. <laughs> but the minute we pull over to check the tire or do what we're doing, we notice real quickly in that trench all the trash. Yeah. So it's just the moments of self-reflection, willing willingness. When, when you're a male, you don't want to slow down because you don't want to see what's in the trench. That's mm-hmm. right. But a man is willing to go, you know what, I need to self-evaluate. I need to dig, not just slow down enough to see what's in the trench, but enough to step down in the trench and start being willing to clean it up. But most guys will tell you, I'm too busy to do that. Yeah. But no, that's, but that's not, I don't, I don't believe that's true. No, or I'm I better. Think, I think we really don't want to know what's down there. So we say we're too busy. We say we don't have time. We that's say avoidance. That's too much trouble. That's avoidance. Sure. But really, we already know what's in there, and it's easier just and to we say don't I'm busy than yeah. to do that. Than to face it. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote this down. We, we can kick this around. Males use their position and power to bully the masses, while real men of God use their position and power to lead others into freedom. So here's who I've got. Pharaoh was a male. Moses was a man. Mm. So let's talk a little bit of what... 
Pharaoh did in his walk. We've seen what David does, and we'll come back to David because there's some real moments of David's life that are challenges, but I want to give you enough Bible characters that fit all of us. And again, I want to tell you, this is to encourage you to do a self-evaluation. And are you using your position, your place, your influence to serve other people? Are you bullying people to accomplish your agenda? Males have agendas. Yeah. Men have become servants. Mm -hmm. It's really easy for him. Jesus came on this planet, and he's God in skin on, as you say all the time, in sandals. Mm -hmm. But in Philippians chapter 2, it says that him being equal with God was not something to be um, realized, to grasp. So he took on the form of a servant. He clothed himself to serve serve others. Well, Pharaoh is a really interesting guy. How does Pharaoh show the maleness of what we all can do when we only walk in the maleness instead of the manhood of what God's called us to do? Mm-hmm. Well, the most obvious one is you just use people to get to your own ends and your own, your own ends. <laughs> um, the, and, and, and when you do that, whether you realize it consciously or subconsciously, there's a devaluation process that mm-hmm. happens, which means I'm better than they are. Hierarchy. Yeah, and in that in that culture, it's just super easy to see because you got Pharaoh and you got slaves. Yeah. Oh. But but you can shake that up in a box and dump it out in any community in America and see it right now that there's a devaluation when you walk in your maleness because in in our maleness, it's about what can I get from you. These are, this, mm. is, these, this is Mark's illustration because we all have an itch inside of us. Yep, sure. And we're all trying to find out how to scratch that thing. And control is a big one for men. Oh. It's what do you control? What do you have authority over? What do you have control over? But, you know, as we were sitting here just before we went on the air, I just wrote down, you know, authority is not about what, it, what you control. It's about what you can improve. Mm. It. It's not about what you can get your hands around. It's what you can get your hands on and then release it, and it's better when you let it go than when you got a hold of it. So that's my first point on Pharaoh was that. So, so today, it's funny we talk about control. Today uh, pulled up my, my app, Jesus, uh, Jesus Calling, and today was uh, the topic was Trust Me Enough. And it says, trust me enough to let things happen without striving mm. to predict or control them. Relax and refresh yourself in the light of my everlasting love. My love light never dims. You are often unaware of my radiant presence. When you project yourself into the future, rehearsing what you will do and say, you are seeking self-sufficiency. Golly. Self-sufficiency. Read the last sentence again. When you project yourself into the future, rehearsing what you will do or say you are seeking to be self-sufficient. It goes on to say, be adequate with my help. So Pharaoh represents someone who absolutely has a self agenda. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. he, he's got something he wants to accomplish and he will use anything and anyone and everything to accomplish what he wants without any regard. He, here's the truth. Guilty. Yep. All of us mm-hmm. are guilty. Of it, and we see some self-talk going on with Pharaoh, where he's he's dialoguing with himself. You know, God starts bringing these ten tests against Pharaoh through a man named Moses, and Moses is a man. I want to show you his manhood. When God called him to go do what he was going to do, he said, "I can't speak. Hmm. I, I, you're you're choosing me. Who am I?" He kept saying this: "Who am I that you would call me to go do this?" And then he asked this question. Who do I say sent me? And and God speaks to him and says this, two things. He said, tell him I am, and Moses, I'll be with you. A male only can do a self-inventory of what he can achieve, and Pharaoh represents that really big. It's all about achievement, power, and control. Strive, 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 and we all fall into that. Moses was so broken and had an evaluation of himself that was probably correct. I stutter. I can't speak. I can't talk. Why are you picking me? Mm -hmm. Well, when we partner with God, God plus you, and you can see yourself as a zero always equals a hundred. And he had to embrace that the I am quit looking at who am I that you would send me? He had to embrace. I am is sending you. 
and I'm able to accomplish all things through you if you'll trust me. You know, when we look at the Bible, it really comes down to, you know, a couple of things, believe, trust, and obey. (laughs) It's pretty simple, but Pharaoh doesn't want to do that. He's the king of his castle, and he really sets himself up to be God. So those three statements, believe, trust, and obey. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like all of us could sit here and prospectively say belief is probably the easiest of the three. Now it can be hard in moments too. Right. But it's the second two that you go trust. <laughs> and then the third one, even hardest obey. Take a so step. That yep. One, that one's the action word. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yep. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh represents that in so many different ways, but we see the outcome of that when Moses takes millions of people out and Pharaoh has to bless them with gold, silver, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. He wasn't striving. He was he was literally believing what God said, trust him to do it, and he took a step and led them out. What breaks Pharaoh is the blood of Christ. All the other tests did nothing to him except harden his own heart. Right. I know that the Bible said he's hardened his heart, but have you ever met someone, the more you love them, the more they harden? Oh. God gave Pharaoh 10 chances by the 10th chance, what changed that situation was the blood that was represented by the lamb. It broke the situation. It was never about Moses' ability, about his communication, about his gifting. Right now, we live in a world right now that I see it all the time. Hey, improve, improve, improve. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed by God's kingdom, who he chose to demonstrate and show off his nature and character, and they're all broken people. Mm-hmm. Every one of them are broken people. Mm-hmm. So a couple other things that... I think, Mark, that before you jump mm-hmm. off of that thought, that's a that's a big statement. It is. Is the, the transition from male to man, or maleness to manliness, and we can put all these different words around, is we've used this phrase, it's sniffing your own cesspool. Mm. Yes. It's to go, I, I've got nothing. Yeah. I've got no game. i got whatever mm. your word is. But there's also moments, and, and you just start going through the Bible, and we listed a bunch of them before we went on the air, of, of Joseph, Moses, Peter, yeah. Paul, right. Saul becoming Paul. All these. There was a moment that not only were they broken, they embraced the brokenness. Mm. They knew they couldn't fix it. Peter knew he couldn't fix it. He, he knew he couldn't fix the, 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 the trifecta denial right. on the day that he goes, you're going to do this. And he goes, oh, no, 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 I'm not doing this. Not me. No, before the sun goes down. you know. But they came to the place that they not embraced it like they loved it, like they're going to hug it and, and just adorn themselves with it, but coming to the – of going, I'm done. But in the Western culture we live in, when we go, we're done, that's the sign of weakness. Yeah. <laughs> Or a big sign of narcissism. But in the when the kingdom, but in the kingdom, it's when God shows up. Yeah, it's the place when He goes. Finally, David, I've just been waiting for you to get here. I'm not mad at you. I just waited for you to get to the end of what you think you've got to bring to this table. So is that humility? It's certainly the the doorway into it. Yeah, good word. Yeah, Yeah. I think if you, I think males have a real time hard time owning their crap. Because they can't afford to, because they become the pharaoh of their own life. Well, the, the, I think some of the mentality that we've all gone through life is the minute we admit weakness, here comes the target. Oh, yeah. It, and it may be true, but being shot at, being rock stone at you, whatever you're going to take from Ben is the very thing that shapes you. We live in a time right now, guys, there is more on social media about narcissism. Let me make it real clear to everyone listening. Everyone has a spoke of narcissism in them. You bet. Mm-hmm. And if you can't agree with that, you may be a narcissist. <laughs> mm-hmm. We love pointing the, ping, the finger at everyone else and their narcissism, but I had to look at, hey, my own, my own thing. Lord, I didn't do anything wrong here. If I go do this, but God's saying, hey, humble yourself. It ain't about being wrong or right. It's about the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. They hung him on a cross for it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's look at how the maleness worked. Judah, 
I'm, uh, Judas and Peter did the same exact thing. Judas wouldn't own how he missed. Peter did. Right. And there's a male. Ju- Judas was a male. You bet. Peter was a man. And Greg is the one that pointed this out to me in Scripture. I'd never seen it before. Greg, point out when Jesus calls the disciples to him after he comes back and Peter. Yeah, so so in in talking about the resurrection when when Christ was crucified and then he come back, I, I called Mark one day and I said, This blows me away. Because he says in scripture he says to I think it was Mary, he says, Let the disciples know that I have risen and Peter. <laughs> mm. So that really stood out to me. Here is the one that denied him. And so what's the perspective? What's the perspective there? Was he wanting Peter to know by calling him out individually? I still love you. Mm-hmm. I love you so much. I'm going to call you individually to say, mm-hmm. and Peter. And see, that's what males will do. Males will make mistakes. I don't care if you're listening to me right now. If you walked in adultery, porn, stole, cheated, lied, we've all done it. And we need to embrace that. Um, but here's here's the difference. Maybe Peter, in his brokenness, started thinking like a male again. Yeah. He started thinking, here's what I did. I can't deny this. I did it. He told me I would do it, and I did it. Before pu- that crow. Pu- publicly. Publicly. Mm. And, the, you know, it's on record. Right. But when he gets the word, wouldn't it have been interesting when Mary said, hey, he told me to grab the disciples and yeah. you. Did he disqualify himself? to no longer be a disciple because of his weakness. But we see this beautiful encounter with with Jesus and Peter. Mm-hmm. He asked him three times, do you love me? They have a talk. He walks him off. It was a public sin and a private conversation that was recorded and journaled for us to see how the nature of character of God works for us. Let me make it really simple. God is trying to show his nature and character off to you today. Mm-hmm. He wants mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. He's got every right to judge you, to judge me, to judge them. Right. And he certainly could have judged Peter. It was a disciple who walked with him for three and a half years. A view of all people, but he brings him back in and brings restoration. I I think one of the other things, males will keep records of wrong. Mm. Men continue to offer forgiveness because, David, you brought it up. They remember the cesspool that they were in or maybe that they would, might be in later. And it develops in you, Greg, you brought this up, humility and a compassion for people. Yeah. Yeah, I look I look back at some of my story and my history. You know, I had a broken relationship with my father mm-hmm. for, for a few years. Um, and I was going through a struggle in another situation, actually in my marriage at the time. And I remember literally being sitting in my truck and screaming, <laughs> not, not not asking, screaming at the Lord, saying, "Why won't she forgive me?" Mm. You know, he responded in in a way that I didn't want to hear. He said, "Like you forgave your father." <laughs> wow. Oh. Ah. <laughs> uh, okay. So walk that out. And I did. And, and I'm grateful you for that. Did. Restored a relationship with my dad, you know, fortunately a few years before he passed. And, but what I realized in that moment was, is I had, that was a, that was my humility moment for that moment. Obviously I've been humble multiple times, but that was me getting humble that I had expectations of others that I wasn't even walking out mm. myself. And I remember telling somebody after saying, you know, yeah, I've, I've reconnected with my dad and I forgave him. And they, they, they said, they asked me this question, well, what did he ask forgiveness for? And I said, he, he didn't. Mm. They said, well, how'd you forgive him? I said, that was my choice. I chose to no longer walk in it. I didn't really even need him uh, to say, I, I'm sorry, I did this, 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 and this. Half the half of it, he probably didn't even realize what he had done to me. It was just me picking up a fence. We talked about yeah, a fence. Yeah. Yeah. But I realized, I wrote this down earlier, I believe when a male becomes a man is when we run from pride and we put on humility. Mm. And I wrote, humility is a coat that attracts many. Oh, it's a good word. Re- where pride repels. Yeah. No one wants to be around a prideful male. No. But a humble man of God, people are drawn to them. Those are led by the God. 
I think in this, you just brought up something for for me. I think males will avoid confrontation and correction. A man invites it and sees it as love. There's a lot of people who see confrontation and correction as hate. Well, you know, again, going back to a little bit of my story is, is I, that was a big problem in my marriage. Mm. Is I, I didn't like confrontation. I thought confrontation was bad, mm. negative. So fortunately, we are, and I say fortunately, because it's the truth. Fortunately, my marriage had gotten to the point where that I had a pile of, of shit. Yep. In, uh, under the under a lot the of rug. trash there, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that I avoided the conflict of it because I felt like conflict meant our marriage wasn't healthy. We didn't have those things going for us. But I realized that you know what, confrontation is good. I just needed to learn to have it healthy. You know, growing up, I never ever saw my parents have. I, well, I would see them have an argument, but I never saw the resolve of it, mm. and which was in my mom and dad's perspective really good because they didn't want to do that in front of us. But what I never saw was the resolve of it. I never saw the healthy conflict from it. So I've had to learn that conflict is healthy. It is. But look at the conflict God has with you. You're popping off in a truck, screaming at the top of your line. <laughs> Who knows the adjectives that are coming out of right. this truck? Because you've got her offense right here. Yep. Like, why won't she do this? Yeah. And the topic doesn't matter, right? Because we all get in those with our wives, sure. children, family, friends, doesn't matter. community, church, yep. whatever. But God's answer back was love. Yeah. God said, listen, if you won't give it away, you're not going to receive it. Mm. And that's what the Bible says. So what's funny is, is the Lord then told me later on through another prophet, a friend of mine, he said, um, your forgiveness and you walking this out is not just for you. You're, the generations behind you are going to see this. And I watched how it impacted mm. my wife, how it impacted my children, my brother, um, with my father and so many things. And, and so a lot of times our pride goes up to where we're not willing to, to walk out that forgiveness because, you know, we, we, we put the stake in the ground. Well, I'm just not going to forgive them. I can't believe they did that to me. No matter what it is. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. Well, you're, you, you just took this statement. Males strive to leave a mark mm. of themselves where real men look for the legacy and you're, you're walking that out, not only with them. I watched you at your dad's funeral, mm. and the things that just moved me. I it was the if I could say this without being disrespectful, it was the most joyful, beautiful funeral I'd ever been because it turned into a celebration service of walking in humility and honor. And some would say, "Well, your dad didn't deserve that." Neither do you. No. Neither do you, but that's what that's what we'll do. We'll, males keep scorecards. Yeah, mm -hmm. men understand what God freely gave away, and God keeps no record of wrong. We don't seem to have a good uh, perspective of that because we live in a world where we're keeping score all the time, yeah. and it's a it's a heavy thing to look at. And here's what's even worse: if you're a man listening to me too, I want you to know, if you ask a man that'll be honest and say, where have you missed it in life? Mm. They will blurt out everything that they've done wrong. And when you tell them, you know that God's never, ever been disappointed in you, <laughs> not once. Because if you could disappoint God, that means that you could surprise him. He knew what you were going to do before you did it. And my life was changed by a very good father. His name's Phil. And Phil had four daughters, and I just had Tucker. And Tucker was, I don't know, two or three and I'm thinking about innocence. I grew up uncovered. I just, you know, drank it, fought it, shot it, and chased it yeah. and came up empty. But I wanted Tucker to walk up your life. And I started telling him how I was going to put in a plan, being total male, I was going to put my plan, which was really manipulation and control. Wow. Because mm. I don't want to go through the pain of watching him do what I did. Ugh. And he quickly corrected me. He said, I have four daughters. Do you think my goal is to raise virgins? I said, absolutely. He said, you have totally misunderstood me and God. Wow. He said, my job is not to try to control or manipulate a situation where they don't miss the mark. Last time I checked, God said that we all miss the mark and fall short of its glory. I want to teach them that they can come into my presence, and no matter how bad they missed it, they'll get grace from me because I got it from my father. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean, it was mind-blowing for me and changed and shaped the way that I would live and the way that I would look at life. That's love. Oh, it was incredible 
love, and I'm so grateful for that man in my life. And and that's what I would say is you cannot get into manhood and live there without other men because you're going to need encouragement. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Yep. So it's hard to sharpen your sword without another man in your life. Right. And when you sharpen, there is going to be conflict. There is going to be correction. That's what mentoring and being fathered and being brother. David and I have been friends for 20 years. And there's times that I've sat on his back porch where he was living in isolation. He didn't want me to show up. And I showed up anyway. I remember I called David and said, David, the smart, call me back. Usually an hour later, I'd get a phone call. Second day, I called and no phone call. And I said, left a message. I said, David, if you don't call me back, I'm showing up at your house. <laughs> and I remember you did. <laughs> that I showed up in his house and I walked to the door. I'm really close with his wife. It's a super sister for me. And I walked in and she just took her eyes and did this. Like, he's out there. Go, Go get, get him. <laughs> so I walked out, me and another guy named Jay, and we sat down with him. And when David saw us, it was not a warm welcome. Right. David looked at me and he said, well, crap. Has it come to this? If I wanted to be around you, I would have called you. I said, well, that's not the point. You show up. Well, we had to endure a little awkward moment there for a moment. But in time, David started opening up, and the pressures of life were folding in on him, and he just needed another man not to fix him. We didn't. Uh, David, do you remember that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did we fix you, or did we just sit with you? No, I didn't. It's something happens in community that's a a, a balm. It's a weird word <laughs> um, that that you really can't explain, and it even yeah. goes back to when you were talking about the difference in in Judas and Peter. Peter, whether he realized it or not, almost involuntarily, his compass went back to the community mm. because when Jesus finds him, he's sitting at the fire with the disciples, trying to figure out what's next. Judas just floated off. Isolated himself. And I floated off that mm. 18, 19 years ago. I had floated off from you and Jay and every, I'd floated off from April. We're living in the same house, but we're not living in the same house <laughs> to the point that, she, that I'd been on that porch for three or four nights right at the fire pit out in, yep. at, at the back of the lot. And she goes, sick them, you know, yep. yeah. they're j just showing up creates the community that, that somebody invades your space in a good way. Yeah that I don't care if you don't like me right now. It's the confrontation. I don't care if you don't like me right now. I'm here to love on you. You can receive it or not, but you have to love on it. But you got to have people that can invade your space and that you've that you've got enough equity in. Mm -hmm. And, mm. boy, that's what I don't think we get. We're living in this whole fast-paced thing right now. We don't let things simmer. We think things are going to happen really fast. Man, we've been doing this 20 years. And, and, and I would have told you five years into it, the Lord was fast-tracking it, and he was. But there's things that have just happened in the last three, four, or five years with boys getting married and grandbabies showing yeah. up and, and being 50 and going, this doesn't feel like I thought it was going to feel. But it took a long time for this soup to cook in this pot. <laughs> but my point is there's equity and there's nothing. When I get stuck now in even fathering a, a, a 26 year old and I know I'm out of my skill set. My immediate thought is what would Mark do right now? Oh. Because he's so different than me, but sure. he's so gifted in a way that I'm not that I go, how do I tap into that? Your words cross pollination. Oh, you yeah. use that word with me a lot. Cause mm. I mean, we're so different, but we've become so alike because of the community. Mm. Well, I think what we did is we made a great exchange, but it took, I love the stew analogy. It took 20 years to make that. People say all the time, man, I'd like to have a friend like David. I'm saying be careful what you ask for because we walked in a lot of ditches together. Back mm. to your analogy, we had to look at our trash together. David grew up a Baptist, a good kid. He was a great at doing checking the boxes. And as David says this, I've heard him <laughs> preach long enough, I was good at being good. And I went, wow, I was bad at being bad. And we both ended up in a ditch that we wanted to shoot ourselves. We ended up on our own trench. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you go back to that Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron. So it sounds really easy, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not a pretty process. No. You think about two pieces of iron coming together. It's not gentle. 
Sparks are flying. Sparks are flying. So, so that's get, part of... get burned if you're close just watching it. Right. Watch doing it. <laughs> right. So, but that means that sometimes when God brings us in a relationship with other men, it's not always going to be pretty. Sometimes you're going to knock... You're, you're, your iron's going to hit my iron, and we're going to make sparks. But the process of that mm-hmm. is the refinement of that mm-hmm. steel. Males avoid the fire. Yeah. Men will stand in the fire. So Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible is a male. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were men. They stood in the fire, and the fourth man in the fire, I was listening to a guy preach this, and I thought it was so great, Mark Driscoll. I want to give him credit for it. He said he thinks it's pretty interesting. When Nebuchadnezzar called the three men out of the fire, he didn't want any part of that fourth man. He didn't call the fourth man in the fire. He would have met Jesus right there. In an Old Testament scripture, he says, you three come out. How are you not burning up? And he says, it's the fourth man in the fire. It's the fourth. He was totally male. He Right now, he wants to understand it. I want to tell you, one of the greatest weapons used against us as men is our minds. The greatest distance that you will ever travel is 18 inches. And you go, Mark, what are you talking about? David, tell us what we're talking about. Mm, it's 18 inches between your head and your heart. We get so stuck in this compare, compete, conform. Mm. How do I fit? How do I not fit? Am I up? Am I down? Am I sideways? Am I, and we're trying to noodle through it. My word is auger. We mm. just, oh, yeah. I do. I just spin in and end up so far underground. I'm not even sure how to get back up because I'm trying to figure it out. In fact, you know, this several years ago, the Lord was waking me up. At, it was between three and three thirty in the morning and it oh. went on for three months, <laughs> several times a week. And I was trying to process the next move in the business and the next move because I didn't know how to get where out of where we were, and I sure didn't know how to get where I wanted to go. And he would sit me in the floor in my den at the house in Hasley, mm-hmm. and I'd start talking, and he'd go, and he's sweet. He'd correct me this way every time. He said, you're thinking you're not praying. Oh. Mm. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I didn't. I don't know that I get it now, but I, <laughs> yeah. I, it's better. I mean, it's, I'm maybe a little better than it was then. But it gets so stuck in your head. But God's not having a relationship with my head. He wants to have a relationship uh, with the heart. And most of <clears> us <throat> men don't want to go there because that is where the crappy stuff is. That is where the shitty stuff is. It it's, is. It is the cesspool. We don't want to smell it. <coughs> we want to put the cologne on and go, I don't want you to I don't want you to come yeah. back to my porch. Yeah. Leave me alone. Avoid it. It is more comfortable. I'm more comfortable in my own pain than this freedom you're trying to take me to. Leave me alone. Mm. We don't say that out loud, but we're so just hell bent instead of heaven bent just to stay. I deserve to feel like this. I'll figure this out. No, you won't. Oh. But that 18 inch trip is, we've said it for years. It's the longest trip most guys ever make. I don't think women have, there are some women that do, but as a, as, as a, as a culture, they're, they're more connected to, or, or there's a, there's at least a thoroughfare there. There's an interstate running between the head and the heart. Yeah, I would agree. Man, that. we can live so much from the neck up. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, the women full of churches, women, mm-hmm. uh, those that are buying Christian books and trying to grow women are the number one men. We've got to, you know, even in giving, man, you want to, you want to, you want to be with women if you're going to ask for money because they're more, bent towards sowing into something than a man is. A man is, we walk in that orphan mentality of get all you can and sit on the can. But a man understands it's better to sow into the kingdom of God. Uh, it's And this topic makes me want to go here about forgiveness because men, we face something totally different. We're out. Uh, there's a weight on us of carrying the family, mm. leading the family. And when I say leading the family, I'm talking about serving the family. Yeah. It's not lording over. It's not hard. It's not control. Hierarchy. No, it's, you know, there's four things. We talked about a lot. Agenda, control, manipulation, and expectation. <laughs> you, if you want to be a male, you'll live in those four. But there's a different side of those, of surrender. Instead of control, I'm going to surrender. Mm. Instead of manipulating somebody, I'm going to serve somebody. But I want to talk about unforgiveness as it relates to us as male, either forgiving yourself or forgiving others. In business, in life, and in ministry, I heard an incredible statement. Um, I'll think of this pastor's name here in a moment. He made a statement that I went, wow, that's true. 
And I think the statement was this. In a male's life, in a normal man's life, every seven years, he will lose a significant relationship. Mm. In a minister's life, he will lose seven significant relationships a year. So that shows you the messiness of ministry. Wow. Whether that's on a platform or in business, when you try to bring the culture of heaven into a business and we start to, it becomes really messy. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of opportunities to forgive people. What would y'all say about the male side of that and the man side of that? What would you say to those listening to this? And it may be a a wife. It may be a a child. I, I run into a lot of people and I live this my life. You know, I would go years without talking to my dad. And because I had a hard time forgiving, he just kept pressing me about Jesus, and it wasn't good. And a prophet had to come in town and tell me, (laughs) you're the only plan God's got for your dad. And I was like, I don't like that plan. Wow. Mm -hmm. All he does is say bad things about Jesus. And he says, well, that's because darkness lives in him, and you have a light. You keep running from darkness, boy. Wow. I was like, whoop. Yes, sir. Hello. Got on the phone, but I had to forgive my dad. I, we get opportunities to forgive people, and I think most males continue to point at the situation or the circumstance instead of the truth. We're Males are more committed to what happened, and a man is committed to what God says and how truth brings that. How have you all seen that? How have you dealt with that in your own life? Well, for me, I look back at my situation with my dad. You know, um, my dad just passed away earlier this year. Mm. And uh, by not walking um, the forgiveness out, um, mm. I would have I would have missed out. Mm. And was, was our relationship perfect after the forgiveness and, and we begin to restore that? No. You know, I set boundaries with my father, and guess what? He crossed them (laughs) multiple times. Mm. But I just kept having to go, he says, 70 times 7. So every time he crossed that boundary, I would just gently, within love, try to reestablish it, but just tell my dad, I still love you. Mm. And so by not being obedient and immediate obedience, if I would have said, okay, I'll forgive him in my time, instead of me walking that out, Who's to say I'd ever seen him? Mm-hmm. The next time, you know, Mark, we, you talked about me speaking at my dad's funeral. I look back at the, the times for years that I didn't talk to him for two years. Mm-hmm. That most that were in that room and in that space had no idea that here I was now speaking at my father's funeral, mm-hmm. not knowing the hurt and pain he caused. But guess what? I realized that I hurt him too. Mm-hmm. And then I caused him pain too. But guess what? In the end, I love him. So forgiveness was worth it. Oh. But it's a price to be paid. I'm not going to say it's fun, right? <laughs> because, you know, forgiveness is a process. And there was moments that I, I honestly, I began to speak. I forgive him before I could ever even make the phone call. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think it's scripture that says, that, you know, speak it as if it is. Mm-hmm. And so I began to say, I forgive you. I'll just walk through with, with one of my staff members um, this same process that's struggling with a similar scenario with a family member. I said, I just want you to start walking out. I forgive you. And, and I had him say, I forgive you. And there was, I forgive you. <laughs> I said, that's okay. Still a little growl behind yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> but that's okay. I said, you don't have to believe it right now. Keep speaking it. Walk it out. God will begin to change your heart. And I think that's what he does is he begins to change our heart and soften us. Because if we start to, if we flip that around and start to look in a mirror, we're not worthy of it either. No, Mm -hmm. no. I think we lose sight of that mirror really quick. And I think you gave a very practical, tactical step. If you're out there and you're walking with somebody or you, you've walked away from somebody and you just don't have forgiveness and you feel like they've done wrong. We oh, There's always two sides to a story. Yeah, I, I love when I hear one side of the story. I always say this inside myself. There's <laughs> always two sides. And the first to tell the story is usually the one with the least amount of character. Mm. But Greg gives a practical, tactical step of 
you just start speaking it. Why? Because scripture says there's life and death in the power of the tongue. Yes. And when we use truth, it changes the atmosphere of our heart. And eventually it'll change all the way over. And I got to be around his dad. I got to see his dad um, mm-hmm. watching him as he was passing gracefully from this earth. And when I walked in, all he could say is, I can't wait to be with Jesus. God is good. God is Ooh. good. He kept saying it. Yeah. Mark, I'm looking forward to Jesus. God is so good. I'm thinking you're dying and God is good. He just kept saying it. He was preparing himself to leave. You know, and males will see the grave as the end, where a man sees it as a stepping stone into eternity. This is a man, my father is a, is a man that his entire life was an athlete. Put college basketball, got out of college, you know, scholarship and college basketball, got out, began, to, fell in love with road cycling, bicycling, um, and rode bikes until his 70s. And until the day he was told by a doctor, you have a brain tumor, it's inoperable, we can't do anything. And his answer immediately was, God is good. <laughs> I, the, you know, we, mm. We've talked about this, but I think it needs to be said. I think, I think we are in a, and I don't know what caused this. Maybe you guys, we can talk through this. But I think we're in a society today that we have m- more emotional immaturity than ever and that's what's holding males back from becoming men is that we've developed uh, a culture that doesn't know how to deal with the emotion Mm. and walk through that that it's okay to be angry but what i do with that is where it separates me from being male versus man you nailed my that Mm. that has been my greatest challenge i'm an emotional person i feel everything i sense everything and Trying to grow up and not strive at that and let God finish the stew, as you said, in my life and not, he keeps telling me, I'll I'll miss the mark and just get angry, do something. Right. You know what he tells me all the time? It's okay. I love you. It's okay. His kindness really does draw us to repentance, but you're right. We live in an emotional society, but if we run off emotions, we'll avoid the truth. There you go. You're going to live in your maleness and live in that and stay bent over worshiping at the Asheron pole. I remember a story of David in business, and you just probably forgot it. David was on a project, and uh, a guy did some stuff, and David paid the man, Mm. uh, but then he skipped out on him, and I think it was around $130,000. Wow. And you had an opportunity, and I I got to have front row seats of that because I never saw you get better. How did you handle that? Actually, I didn't, I don't know that I handled it really well, but April did. Mm. So you invited her in? I invited her into the space. That's yeah. what men do. And and, mm. and she helped me re, um, rename it um, in a lot of ways because of the way she's, words matter to her. Oh. What she says matter to her. Um, she's bold with her words, but she'll stop you with your words. Mm, yes, she she would say, stop saying that. Oh, <laughs> stop using that word. Stop declaring that because every time you say it, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Um, but yeah, letting it go was was her sitting me down and go, stop it. Mm. Yeah, but I deserve to feel like this. You know how long it took to get there, to make this, to get that, to even have this opportunity? And when I'm saying that, I'm saying it to her. Yep. Yeah. But, but I'm really saying it to the Lord. Mm. And as you're talking about this thing I'm sitting over here and I'm I've got this big circle in my little notes over here and it's it's sovereignty. Oh and it's where we started whenever we started this yeah. forty five minutes ago. Right. Trust. Right. Do I really? Right. Do I really? Mm-hmm. Now that's easy to say in church. It's easy to say when it's all great and yeah. you close the deal and you sold the ranch <laughs> and you sold the building. Yeah. And we moved on and you had a great and, and things are going well in the ministry and all that. But when the stuff hits the fan and it comes out of the trenches, you go, "What? What's the question then?" Well, the is funny it why me, or is it, Lord, what are you trying to teach me right now? Well, the funny thing is, as we walk through trust, what I feel like we want is trust to last this long. Well, I can trust you <laughs> for a, for a minute, for so, three steps, so and I need a, you to hurry up. So on it has this. a really short expiration date. <laughs> But the reality is sometimes it's like, uh, no, no, this is a season and your trust season here is going to be four months. 
Wait, wait, four months? Or worse. You How don't get a date. Yeah. Which is usually where it is. That's right? usually where it is, yeah. So, but we ideally go, well, we want to start negotiating. Yeah, and I don't know about you. He doesn't negotiate with me. It's me negotiating with him, and yeah, him just keep saying the same thing back to me. Right. Yeah. But you, there's another practical and tactical step that I, I want the listeners to listen to. David, you did an incredible thing. Ma- mm-hmm. Males will keep it inside and, and try to figure it out by themselves. You invited your wife into a situation that brought wisdom. Women bring Huge. more wisdom to the table if we'll allow them and invite them. And that's what. That's what a man does. You know, when wisdom is mentioned in the Old Testament in the Hebrew, it's always female. Mm. Oh, wow. That the makes root, sense. The root of that word is female. It's not a masculine word. It's a female word. Does it have Leslie right next to it? <laughs> what? No, I think it's Shannon. Too. <laughs> or April. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. It's the, uh, but it's good. It is. But well, in, in fact, in fact, Proverbs says court wisdom. Mm. Is that an interesting word? Pursue court. her. Oh, Pursue wow. Pursue her. Mm. Lay down, you know, the, 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 the treasure. I, go go dig it up. Go find I'm, it. I'm hoping Shannon doesn't more, listen to this. <laughs> wisdom, wisdom is more valuable than yeah the rubies, yeah, gold, yeah, yeah. Yeah, silver. Yeah. Oh yeah. no, it's it's an interesting topic when we talk about just being a male. And if you're out there and you feel like golly, I feel like I'm so male right now. It's okay. Yeah, that's what God's saying to you. It's His kindness that draws you back. We can't change something. One of the things that. I think that we've got to do is, first of all, we've got to identify what's happening. Then we've got to reject the lie that's in us. Then we've got to replace it. And then we've got to use our mouth to respond, but respond in the right way, which is a declaring. And so for me, you know, I have to, I had to do it today. Um, I'm dealing with a situation where, you know, people fall. I'm in the ministry and we see a lot of broken pastors and what they go and missteps and things. Sure. I'm shocked of how mean we can be. It's the only place, and I really mean this, like I've I've gotten to see execution sh- straight up and be there. And what I'm talking about, Taliban in the back of the head guns. It's not a real gun. It's words. We want to shoot somebody that's messed up. We don't want to bring restoration and gentleness so I had a man ask me, I don't know how you're always hopeful. It, no matter what it is, whether it's an affair or cheating, lying for a pastor, they're supposed to be the man of God. And I said, they're no different than us. Mm. And we've so created and moved them to a place where they're supposed to live a perfect life. I, y'all, I've been a minister for 35 years. I'm one of the worst Christians I know. I mess up more than anyone I know. Christianity is not about perfection. It's about coming back to the Father and being teachable and willing to take the steps that truth tells you to take. And if you're going to be a man and you're going to follow God, you're going to have to be teachable. You're going to have to be correctable. And you're going to need some other friends. I've got Greg sitting around. We, we hunt together, spend time together. He doesn't know this, but there's a time I'll be talking and he'll say, Now, Marcus, that's all he says. Now, Marcus... What he's saying to me is reframe that. Let's Mm. look at a different perspective of that. Is that really what you mean or are you just venting right now? And I'll say, well, Greg, I guess what I'm really saying, I'm hurting. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Thanks for sharing it with me. If you need men and women in your life, listen, you will never reach your full maleness without woman. True. You just won't. I'm not talking about being married. That is a great gift to the body is women. I'll spend the rest of my life helping women get to the place they are, which means them getting to a place where they can share the voice. Well, do we have any final comments from you guys on male versus a man? Anything that y'all want to share to the listeners? Anything you want to encourage them and what they're going through in their life? I, I got I got two things. Okay. Um, one, I think, you know, when we started talking about this mark a little while back, uh, the Lord gave me two things or a few more, but I think the transformation begins when we start as a male is, I think the transformation becoming a man starts when we begin to identify our identity in Christ, not the identity that our parents have given us. Mm. Now there's truth in the, the identity our parents gives us, but it's 
probably not the calling. And that's maybe a better way yeah, to say it. That's great. And when we start as a man to seek the, the, our identity in Christ and who he calls us to be, you know, Mark, you know, I've talked about this a hundred times. I begin to really pray and ask the Father when when Jesus and, and God are on the throne and they're talking about Greg Potts, who do they say I am? Well, eventually in time, he told me he called me his little shepherd boy. Mm -hmm. So I, in that, I begin to understand who my <laughs> what my identity was and the calling on my life. Um, and that, you know, that changed everything, um, for me. Second, he gave me this scripture, Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Mm -hmm. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Wow. That'll hit you right in the mouth. A little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all learning that. Our stew's still cooking. David? Um... You know, I'm in the middle of rereading re some old books. You know, you know, I read old books. I, I like to read things by people who are already dead. I know that sounds strange, <laughs> but what it does to me mm. is 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 it shows me that there really is nothing new under the sun. Mm. So whatever this thing is that I think I'm looking for, there isn't a new revelation. He hasn't changed. Mm. Mm. And one of the things I've been reading is a uh, is one of the older books by Brennan Manning and. Um, and it's rattling around in my spirit, and so I'm just going to share it with you guys today. And it, at some point in the process of him in, in him writing this book, he's telling this part of this story of this long season of his life, and and he realized that he had this image of I I know Jesus, I know I'm saved, I know I'm forgiven, I know He loves me, but he said I saw this picture of myself in heaven, and then he said, and the first question God asked me, he said, Did you know how much I loved you? Mm -hmm. While you were there, huh. did you know how much I loved you? That's part of what I'm having to discover is my identity as a 60-year-old man, that mm. I'm Abba's child, that I'm really that good. The Father has given you a new name. Yeah. That's, that's biblical. Revelation 3 says that we're going to stand before the throne, and he's going to give you a name that only you hear and only he understands. <sighs> There's not another one like Greg. There's not a one like Mark. There's not another one like me. But constantly what I was looking at, we're not going to read it, but I was reminding myself about a year and a half ago, we wrote, us and a group of other people, we wrote declarations for ourselves. Yes, we did. Over ourselves, and mine stuck to my mirror in the mornings, and part of it in here is my soul man will not be will be ruled over by my spirit man. Come on. Because my emotions are all over the place. My mind is all over the place. This yeah. thing is not connected most of the time. But if I can get settled, and I mean really settled, back into the lap that he really, really loves me. He no matter is, what. He is the dad standing on the porch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's still king of the universe. He is the high, holy, unapproachable, don't even think about trying to figure him out, God, but he is still the dad who's standing on the porch. I love the way you – David relabeled the, the parable of the prodigal son as the running father. Come on. Instead of the prodigal running away, it was the father running too. And I love that. And so if you're a man out there and you've been walking through this maleness, I've got so many little statements. We see that Pilate was a male and Jesus was a man. Pilate took his position and power and said, don't you know I have the power to let you go? And you, and you know, Jesus, you're talking about sovereignty. He was like, this is Mark's version. You idiot. You don't know anything. I'm here to die for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about that I'm learning and pursuing, and it's 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 falling forward all the time. If you're going to be a man, you've got to walk in gentleness and love because that's what Jesus did. That's what he modeled. He came. Yes, he turned over money tables. Yes, he he, he did a lot of crazy things. Um, he spoke true to the Pharisees and Sadducees to a point that it's just, you talk about irreverent. He looked at the religious leaders and said, you can't see me and you can't hear me because your father is the devil and you can't not receive my words of life. You know, but even when he said that, it was with a heart to draw them, to wake them up. I'm standing in front of you. Yeah. It's me. I'm the one who made you. I think if you're really going to walk as a male, we've got to walk out 
the truth about gentleness and love, speaking the truth in love. And I'm going to tell you, as you go try to do this, you will fail many, many times. It's not about perfection. It's about learning the art of Jesus Christ, not the art of war. That's, that's a bad book. I don't want to learn the wisdom from this world. I want to understand, love your enemies, forgive your enemies, continue to serve. That's what he did. And listen, we're coming into a time right now. We're going to walk into 2024. And if you don't think 2024 is going to be chaotic, I don't know what you're smoking or what you're thinking, but it's going to be crazy. But we can have the peace of God in our life and be the light. As the world gets darker, we get brighter. We've been on a ranch before, and you take a flashlight, and you are miles and miles away, and I click that on. Greg can be 350 acres away from me. He knows exactly, exactly where I am because the light, the light shines best in darkness. So no matter what you're going through in your life, we want to invite you in to getting into a community, a friendship, really a brotherhood of Christ. That Someone's sharpening you. Someone's loving you. So, guys, thanks for joining us today on talking about male versus being a man. Thanks so much for listening to the Unbridled Life Podcast. We know your time is valuable, and we hope we bring real and relevant content that helps you live that unbridled life. If you want to help us spread the message, you can rate or review the podcast on whatever platform you like to listen to us and share it with a friend or two. If you want to know more about who we are and what we're doing, Head on over to the Unbridled Life Podcast dot com and learn more.